Everyone knows that drones are cool, but did you also know that drone technology is being used across industries to make work easier, safer, and more efficient? Nicholas Pilkington is one of the people helping make that possible thanks to his company, Drone Deploy. Using Drone Deploy, anyone can send out a drone to map an area and then receive detailed imagery and data that can help with oversight, problem solving, and even disaster relief. Currently, Drone Deploy is used on around 600,000 job sites around the world in more than 180 different countries and has mapped more than 60 million acres of ground. On this episode of IT Visionaries, Nick talks about how he got into the drone business, the ways he thinks the industry will continue to grow, and what he's doing to use drone technology to give back to the world. This podcast is sponsored by the Lightning Platform by Salesforce. Salesforce just introduced the Lightning Platform Mobile, the low-code mobile app development platform that empowers anyone to easily build, publish, and manage AI-powered mobile apps for employees and for customers. Find out more at salesforce.com slash build mobile apps. Welcome to another episode of IT Visionaries. I'm Ian Faison, Chief Content Officer here at Mission.org. And in an undisclosed location in downtown San Francisco at Drone Deploy HQ, Nick, what's going on? How's it going, Ian? It's great to be here. It's great to have you on the show. We're going to talk about drones today, all things drones. And boy, are we excited to get into it. But first, how'd you get into technology? That's a good question. Um, I'm originally from South Africa. That's where I grew up. That's where I went to school. Uh, That's where I did undergrad. And then after undergrad, I went off to the UK, did some more studying. I kind of stayed in technology. I did my PhD in machine learning. And I kind of popped out of university in 2013. And at that point... Me and my two co-founders, we were really looking to do something cool with drones. Like drones were a new thing in 2013. And coming from South Africa, there's a really big rhino poaching problem there. Mm -hmm. People come across the border, they hunt rhinos and elephants, and they sell the ivory. And we were looking at solutions to kind of prevent this from happening and police the borders of the large game reserves in South Africa. And the largest game reserve in South Africa is the Kruger National Park. And it's massive. It's about the size of Israel. So we thought, well, let's use drones. Let's sort of fly the borders of this national park, look for hunters, I mean, poachers coming across the border and kind of protect the animals. So we thought that's a great idea. Let's get some drones flying in the air. This is 2013. So we bought the latest and the greatest drones and we tried to get them up in the air flying to sort of take photographs. And we realized that was really hard. Drones, although they were super cool, they're actually just really science experiments. It was really, really hard to get something done repeatably and reliably. Mm -hmm. And that was the kind of jumping off point for Drone Deploy. We thought, okay, this hardware is really good. It's becoming cheaper. It's becoming better. But it's still really hard to get anything done. The missing piece was a piece of software that would make it easy for anyone to get something done with a drone without knowing anything about drones. And that was the kind of inspiration. That's where we jumped off and said, let's build that piece of software. And that was what would become Drone Deploy. That's fascinating. Was it like, have you seen those things now with rhinos and elephants where they they like paint their tusks like pink? Have you seen this? Absolutely. It's so great. (laughs) It's like, man, that is some next level genius stuff. Uh, Because it's like the dye so that it basically like ruins the ivory. Devalues it. it, yeah. Yeah, devalues it. That's great. That's a very altruistic kind of starting point. So did you spend your own money? How did you, were, were, did you like found the company with the idea to like launch the drones in South Africa? Or were you like hanging out with your buddies and flying drones and pretending like you were doing a company? <laughs> we did use our own money, even though we had almost no money. But <laughs> that was the kind of vision. The vision was to help there. And I think what we realized soon after that was it's not just about policing or approaching. If we thought about it, we felt that almost any industry in the world could in some way benefit from an aerial point of view. Mm -hmm. And if we could make that easier, more convenient, less expensive, that would be a really useful, powerful piece of technology to bring to the world. And that's where we kind of focused on like, how do we make these things simple? How do we make them reliable? How do we make them repeatable? How do we turn a drone into something like a kettle or a toaster where there's one button on it, yeah. You push that button and you know what's going to happen and that's going to happen every single time. Because drones weren't like that. They were so complicated. You had to buy an autopilot and a camera. You had to configure control coefficients. You had to find some extra software to try and fly it. Really were science experiments. 
and that's what we went after. It's funny at our mission offsite, we have we have a couple drones. Uh, our CEO Chad loves drones, so <laughs> he uh, he but it was like first thing like got money for this. We did the same thing. Basically, we like first thing, we're going to buy drones because we're media and we're like, hey, drone footage is really fun. There's a lot of things you can do with video and all that. So Chad bought a bunch of drones and so we, we were flying them. So we have our first team offsite. We have like a really cool shot of like our whole team, like of the drone, like awesome. coming up. We thought we were super, we're like, oh, we'll like lie in a circle and we'll put the drone in the middle of the sand. It was on the beach uh, a little bit south of here in California. And uh, we all lie in a circle. And then the drone took off and it blew sand in like all our <laughs> eyes. So the first shot is like all of us, like with our hands covered. It's pretty good. But, I, but you know, I, and I forget who said this, but somebody famous once said that uh, all true, like, disruptive technology start as toys, right? And I think that that was the thing, like, these commercial drones that we kind of saw, like, hey, this is really cool. This is fun. It's fun to fly them. You can, now they have these cool cameras. Like, that's cool. But how do you get business insights? So how did you kind of take the, like, this is cool, add the software, and then start to say, like, what are the actual business insights that we can pull from this? Yeah. I mean, the perception at that point, this is 2013, was that drones were big, gas-powered, fixed-wing aircraft, pretty much small planes. The reality, and the reality going forward from here, is that drones are small, they're plastic, they're electric, and they're highly capable. Mm -hmm. And that's what a drone is. And in 2013, when we tried to think of, like, how do we make these things useful, the first thing is, like, let's get them flying. And that was really exciting. Like we're three nerds sitting in a room, we're going <laughs> to fly some robots. And that was exciting. So we wrote some software to fly the drone, get it in the air and fly it automatically. And we thought, that's awesome. We're done. We, we've got something valuable here. And we realized shortly after that, when we tried to show it to some customers, that flight is amazing, the miracle of flight. But in and of itself, it's not that useful. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sort of give anyone anything. So we went back to the drawing board and said, OK, we've, we've got the drones flying. What do we need to do after that? Let's get some imagery. So we took the drones and we flew them and we collected photographs, photographs over farms. And we went back to those customers and said, look, we're flying the drone automatically and we're collecting a bunch of images. And again, that still wasn't enough because all we were giving them is 400 JPEGs on an SD card. And if you've got 400 JPEGs of corn, it's really, really hard to see where you are or what's going on. So we needed to process that into some other data asset that was really easy to explore. And that's where we sort of started building photogrammetry platform, which a customer can upload all those images taken from the drone, and we generate new types of data. We generate orthographic maps, 3D models, topography, point clouds, and give those back to the customer in the browser, and then they can kind of analyze the scene. They can measure distances. They can see where their crops are under stress. They can measure volumes, stockpiles, reports, all that type of stuff. And it was only after we'd done all three of those stages that we actually had something that was useful. And that's when we kind of sort of talked about this pattern for using drones of fly, process, analyze. Flying is collecting the imagery. Processing is getting that imagery to the cloud, generating really accurate 3D um, pieces of data. And analyze is asking whatever questions you have about that data and answering them in the browser. And those questions obviously vary by industry, construction, mm -hmm. agriculture, surveying. They all want to sort of understand different things from that data. But the idea of just digitizing the site once using drones and then being able to answer all those questions as they come up afterwards in the future is very compelling. Instead of having to go out to the site, measure a distance, come back and think, oh, hang on, we need to measure another distance. Let's go back out there. So do that whole digitization process, very high accuracy, very low cost. Then you got the data. Do whatever you want with it. Share it, explore it, analyze it. Yeah, I mean, I think there is kind of that that moment in time where you get that first amount of imagery and you're like, I know that this is super valuable. And then the second moment is, oh, man, we got to go through all this. <laughs> like somebody, some gal on our team has to go through and figure out what the heck we're going to do with all this. Because now it's got from the point that my boss, we used to have nothing. Now we actually have something. Now my boss is going to expect that we deliver insights from that. What were some of those first customers like that you had that you were working with to create those kind of business insights, some of those use cases? Yeah, I mean, Jeffrey Moore describes this really well in, in Crossing the Chasm. You've got these kind of early adopters. They're yep. very tech-enabled. They're very smart. They really want to try the latest and the greatest. 
and they're really excited about using technology in its kind of rawest form. And I think for us, the first application was agriculture and specifically crop scouting. Mm -hmm. How do we give growers and farmers an aerial view of their field every day? Because that fundamentally has a lot of value. Um, a farmer's field is very different the day after it's rained. And if you're managing 300 acres of corn and that corn's grown to 11 feet tall, you can't really see what's going on in your field unless yeah. you drive around to a certain point, which they do, and put a stepladder up in the back of a truck and look for problems. And you can go to a couple of places on your, on your farm, but you can't see everything. So we worked on providing a very simple and easy crop scouting tool where you could put the drone on the ground, you could draw a polygon around your farm on the phone, and you could say, get map. And we'd deliver you back an aerial view of your entire farm. And that was it. That was the first version. We didn't try and uh, do anything smart, like understand where the crops are damaged or under stress. Let's just provide that view. And a, a grower could look at that and say, okay, there's a problem over there. There's a problem over there. I need to go over there and just make their day more efficient. And the result of that technology being very convenient and very accessible is they could fly it every day. Instead of sort of waiting maybe once a year and doing a satellite imagery buy mm -hmm. or paying for low-flying aircraft, they could fly the drone every day. And that became part of their workflow. Start the day, look at the drone map. What do we have to do? We have to go and inspect over there. This area is ready to plant, whatever. It reminds me of the Clayton Christensen thing where he says disruption is this second disruption drop in the beginning of this episode is something that's exponentially better than nothing and it's like the difference between putting a ladder like driving a ladder out to the center of your property and climbing up <laughs> it versus like drone capture every single day is exponentially better than nothing and it's also like you said exponentially better than the satellite image that you might get once a year or the flyover that you might get a couple times a year which is potentially way more expensive anyways. What is the scope of drone deploy right now as, as current state in 2019? I think it's been very humbling to kind of watch this this company grow. Right now, drone deploy is used on around 600,000 job sites around the world in over 180 different countries. And we've mapped over 60 million acres of ground. Wow. Those early folks, like what was their feedback like what was their reactions when you started working with them they wanted more which is always good to hear it's it's stressful when you're a small company with like limited resources because you end up with this ever-growing list of kind of requests of like oh can we do multi-spectral imagery mm -hmm. can you do ndvi to show us where the crops are under stress can we measure crop heights uh, can we export to other pieces of software um, but that's really exciting to see when you're early on building a company because you're starting to feel that that pull towards product market fit. Mm -hmm. Like you've got a fundamentally valuable piece of technology. How do you get it out to more people? How do you make it better? How do you go after more and more specific problems in that space? And I think that was really exciting for us to see in agriculture. We didn't really know starting drone deploy what industry would use drones the most heavily. We had a, had a feeling that agriculture was going to be the earliest industry, but not necessarily the biggest. Uh, it made sense that it would be the earliest because you're flying over crops, you're flying over cornfields, you're not flying over cities. So it made sense that it would be easier to get the technology out there in terms of regulation and that other industries would follow as the kind of trust grew in it. And they own the land, so they can fly over their own land, presumably. Absolutely. Uh, and it's large amounts of area that you can cover, you know, in a, in a short amount of time. Yeah, you know, with a drone. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's like it makes it kind of checks all those blocks of like, hey, this is our ideal customer profile, right? It's exactly. Like, um, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, so I mean, that was that was great learning for us to actually just engage with the agricultural community and genuinely try and understand like what can we do more efficiently because I mean, there's a risk going out there as some sort of Silicon Valley. Uh, oh, totally. company going out to the Midwest and saying, hey, buy this technology, we know more about farming than you, because that's not true. Everyone there has been farming the same farm for 10, 20, 30, 100 years. You can't go there and tell them how to farm. So we really had to listen. We really had to sort of engage and understand, like, what are the problems that are time-consuming, tedious, expensive, error-prone, and for which of those problems is are drones the best solution? Yeah. You don't want to just pitch drones as a solution to everything, because they're not. And a lot of the time our customer doesn't really mind where that imagery comes from. They just want to answer questions like, show me where my crops are under stress. Show me where I need to make decisions. Whether that imagery comes from a drone or a camera on a stick probably doesn't matter. 
It just turns out that drones are the most efficient solution for a lot of these use cases. And that's what we went after. Do you follow a drone shark app on Instagram? Yeah. <laughs> so good. So this is uh, in Australia. I think it's just the, is it just a couple guys? I think so, yeah. Yeah, it's a couple guys who have this drone and they do all sorts of live video of Bondi Beach and a few other beaches in uh, in Sydney. And basically they just like look for sharks and it's like blown up over like even the past like couple weeks is is getting huge. But you think about like that type of utility. You go from how you spot a shark is someone sees a shark. <laughs> and that means that they were close enough to see the shark to you can spot a shark potentially as soon as it enters that bay or that area right away, alert the lifeguards and then have, you know, things in place. Like again, lifeguards and people have been at that beach for like a thousand years, you know? And it's like now all of a sudden with, with this drone, it's instantaneous that they can just, you know, radio into the lifeguards. How much better does that make, you know, that beach going experience, how much safer do you feel? I was in, I was at Bondi Beach like a month ago <laughs> and I, I didn't know about the app. And ever since my buddy sends me, you know, videos of this, like, this is where <laughs> we were in that water, you know, and there's hammerhead sharks, all this sort of stuff. And there's so much fear around like that sort of thing, right? Like shark attacks and all of that. How much better can you alleviate those things with just a simple use of technology executed in the right way? Do you feel like you kind of have that responsibility now that you have some of this like opening people's eyes to like what's possible with the ease of use and the efficiency? Obviously, with satellite imagery and stuff, we, we've had that type of technology for a long time. But the ease of use and how you could drive business insights is really the new thing. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of this is about communicating the convenience of like what drones can do. And I think there's definitely going to remain a place for drone imagery as well as satellite imagery. Um, they both kind of serve different use cases. Mm -hmm. And with the drones, you're typically looking at a, a smaller area of acquisition, potentially with oblique imagery around the sides of walls, buildings, and towers. And as we go further into the future, even flying indoors. Mm -hmm. and I think that's really exciting. So I do feel it is a lot of responsibility on companies like Drone Deploy to communicate what can be done with drones and how to succeed with them, as well as building the technology and trust around making them convenient, reliable, full solutions that can really solve hard business problems automatically. And I think that's really exciting. So flash forward to now, 2019, what types of companies are you working with? What are the types of people that you're working with? You know, our, our listeners who are CTOs and CIOs of, of large companies that are potentially interested in exploring something like drone deploy or leveraging drones in their business. Like what are the types of use cases that you're that you're looking at now? In terms of industries, the biggest industries on the drone deploy platform are construction, agriculture, and energy. And what's interesting is that typically these are the least digitized industries in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's been a really exciting journey for us getting this technology out there and seeing it be adopted by these industries that are typically not the first adopters of high-tech solutions. So in construction, for example, where we're seeing like really large growth and for the utility of drones, there are so many use cases on a construction site for which drones are a really awesome solution. And there are also a number of different positions in a kind of construction org where drone technology makes sense. Mm -hmm. For example, on a daily basis, managing a job site and just understanding progress. What's been done, what hasn't been done, is this project on track? That's where we're seeing a lot of usage in the construction industry for somebody doing a daily assessment of a job site. And one of the patterns that we're seeing is the skills required to operate a drone successfully are going down. Drones mm -hmm. are becoming cheaper, they're becoming more capable, especially with software like Drone Deploy. You don't need to be a drone expert. You don't even need to know how to fly a drone. So you can go there and you can have your construction site mapped every day. You can have a digital record of progress all the way through the project. And you can use that to kind of make predictions. Like, is my project still on track? Where are the problems? What's been missed? What's been installed or built in the wrong place? And that's really valuable if you propagate those insights all the way up in a construction org to the point that somebody is responsible for managing a number of construction sites. And there the questions they might be asking are, 
why are my projects running 8% over budget? Why are my projects getting delayed? And to have all that insight, to have that full digital record of what do these sites look like every single day is pretty compelling. And I think it's those sort of advances in our technology that are helping kind of lead this adoption into industries like agriculture, construction, and energy. We did a podcast, Future Cities, um, where season one, we were looking at a lot of things with construction. One of the things that was so fascinating is that it's actually like regressing. Projects are getting slower and it kind of, and like there's like the, oh, well, construction, uh, like how is that happening? Well, you think about a building, you know, a hundred years ago, versus now, the level of complexity is like 100x. There's way more systems, there's way more technology, there's way more integrations than like there ever have been. So if you're not leveraging technology to be able to build, then like how can you keep up with the pace of innovation? I think the thing that you said about like flying inside of buildings is so fascinating because, you know, you could have a drone fly, you know, we'd, we'd sit, Salesforce Tower is right around the corner here, you know, the fact that as that's being built, you could have a drone flying to every single floor checking all the time for different, you know, status updates is fascinating. Is there something like off in the future that you see, you know, the five year, 10 year horizon or whatever it is that you see where those types of things are just kind of commonplace? Absolutely. The the vision for our company hasn't changed in the six years that drone deploy has been around. And that vision is a drone on every job site. And our feeling is that If the hardware commoditization continues, that drones get more capable, fly further, become cheaper, and we on the software side make drones easy to use and convenient for solutions, then the drone is going to be something that's a tool on every job site. It's the thing that's in the cupboard on every construction site, or it's the thing that sits in a box and every morning takes off on its own and performs a visual inspection, comes back, lands, and recharges itself. And that's the vision where like you then have this automatic digitization process. It's happening every morning. Your whole site is being inspected. It's being compared to maybe your BIM model in construction to assess progress or where issues are. And those reports are just being disseminated to the right people. So you really go towards this state of like full autonomy, full solutions, full convenience. And I think that's very compelling because now we're already seeing the beginning of that. That's something that's definitely going to happen over the next three to five years. And I think that's the end state for this technology is that you have a drone on every site. It's doing its thing. It's doing that automatically. And you're just getting the value from that. You're just getting the value from having that new way of digitizing the site and analyzing progress and problems and reporting them. It's like the Ron Popeil, whatever, Easy Bake or whatever that thing is called. (laughs) Set it and forget it, right? Set it and forget it. Absolutely. You do do it once. You have the person fly the route that you want to fly on on day one. And then for the next hundred days, it flies that and you have, you know, a accurate the same picture every single day exactly weather permitting I exactly well we need those waterproof drones yeah so yeah, yeah. got to do that yeah drone deploy waterproof <laughs> it's on the list yeah what about the folks that are worried about like you know an an army of of amazon drones that are flying in the sky that that blocks out the sun that every single day that there's so many you know drones flying all over do you think that that's like a fair worry or do you think that it's kind of just people being worried about change you mean a worry that we won't be able to see the sun well the sun's pretty big i think (laughs) i think we'll be okay there i think this more comes from a regulatory and a privacy standpoints Mm -hmm. of, yeah, we've got a lot of companies pushing very sophisticated, very exciting technology that's going to unlock a bunch of very futuristic use cases, whether it's automatic site inspection with cameras or uh, delivering packages. And I think with any type of new technology that comes out, there's the other side of that of like, what um, what is the dark side of this? How are we thinking about making sure we use this for good? And I think a lot of the regulation is going to help with that. We've seen the regulation become more progressive in terms of drones. And I think that's been really exciting because it's it's pushed the technology forward. It's started to build a lot of trust about what drones can do and how they can be used for solving new problems. On the privacy side, I mean, privacy laws haven't changed. You're not allowed to invade anyone's privacy with a camera, regardless of where that camera is. Uh, You can't hold a camera over somebody's wall and photograph them. You can't fly a drone and photograph someone in the Mm -hmm. house. 
Um, so I think those two issues get conflated sometimes, drones and privacy. Privacy laws haven't changed. They should be enforced. They're yeah. really important. Drones are a new technology like other previous new technologies that are coming out. And we need to sort of have these discussions about how to how to use them properly, how to use them correctly, how to enforce the fact that they're used properly. And drone employ helps with a lot of those things. Like we'll prevent people flying in unregulated airspace and help organizations roll out drone programs effectively where the operators can't make those mistakes. They can't take off in the wrong place. They can't fly over the wrong area. Uh, we can limit all those things, and we do. And I think that's something that's also driven a lot of this adoption, especially with big companies, that they can have the trust that the software is looking after them. It's not letting them make mistakes, even accidentally. Well, I'm, I think it's something that, you know, CIOs and, and CTOs that listen to this show, we talk a lot about governance, right? It's the same exact sort of thing. You need to have a governance over your IoT devices, <laughs> whether it be, you know, drones or otherwise. Uh, you know, bring your own device makes sense. Bring your own drone to work might not. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe it does. But the idea that on a platform that they're connected, that they're connected to the mothership, for lack of a better word, and that that those are have a like unified governance for your company for the use case that you're using them for is the super important part because otherwise we just have you know a potential that you know there there is uh, bad um, actors yeah bad actors exactly. absolutely I mean we take this super seriously in fact we're the we're the only drone software company that has the ISO 2701 security certification and that's a big deal when you're talking to big big companies big customers. We take the security and the governance of the data that we're collecting and the drones that we're flying super seriously. And, and getting that certification is not an easy undertaking. That was 18 months of effort. But yeah, we're showing our customers that security is important and that their data is secure. So yeah, it's a priority for us. I want to switch gears to the flyanthropy. Is that what it's yeah, called? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, this is pretty cool. And it's something that startups the best startups, uh, figure out a way to drive, you know, public good right away. Obviously, you started the company with that in mind, but tell us a little bit about the philanthropy program and, and why was it important for you to start this? I think we realized that there's a lot of opportunity to do good with this technology and do good, not just with the technology and what we're building, but with the data that we're collecting and with the people who are sort of giving their time to drone deploy just by virtue of working here. And we wanted to formalize a way to kind of give back because that's obviously something that was quite close to our hearts. Like I said, starting the company and to kind of formalize that as the company grows and you realize that you do have resources to be able to help, we wanted to do that. And I, one of the ways in which we've done that is the philanthropy program, which has all manner of philanthropic activities to support the community, support education around drones, support conservation use cases. And that rolls into our kind of larger vision of dronedeploy.org, which is going to be the sort of umbrella for all of these types of activities. And the pattern that we're going to try and follow is one which I think was pioneered by Salesforce, which was the 111 pattern of giving back, where you give 1% of your time 1% of the company and 1% of the product. And each of those things, 1% of the time being 1% of all the employees that we have at Drone Deploy, which mm -hmm. is about 115 people now, having the opportunity to give back to the community, give back to philanthropic causes. 1% of the product is the intention to spend some of our resources building stuff that's not going to benefit the company financially, but that's going to help. And 1% um, of the company in terms of giving back as well. So that's something that's been formalized this year. We're really excited about that. We're getting a lot of positive feedback and we think there's genuinely a big difference we can make. I think one of the things that really highlighted this was Campfire last year where Drone Deploy was used for coordinating about 16 task forces flying underneath the smoke canopy to actually survey the area and oh, see, no where, see where buildings had been destroyed, um, see where people were. It was the biggest sort of drone task force that's ever been sort of deployed in one go. And we realized after that point, like there is a huge amount we can do in terms of like disaster response and making data accessible. Yeah. Because in that case, they couldn't fly planes in the smoke. Yep. Satellite imagery couldn't see below the smoke. And we had all this imagery on the platform. It's like, okay, we need a way to be able to respond to these things when they happen. We need a 
some sort of pattern to make this data accessible to uh, emergency services and task forces. And that kind of initiated the growth from what had been philanthropy into something larger, which will be dronedeploy.org. Yeah. You know, and the campfire for those of our listeners who don't know, I mean, I think at this point it was the it was the largest fire in California state history. Yeah, the yeah. most destructive wildfire. And those type of use cases are really endless. When in future cities in the podcast that I mentioned earlier, we talked to um, the former city planner for Detroit. And he was saying that back in 2013, um, when he started working with Detroit, they had, I want to say off the top of my head, I don't know. So producers, you can check back on this. But it was something like 200,000 homes in Detroit that were basically vacated, that now is owned by the city of Detroit, that foreclosed. And you have to go look at those. Like there could be people in there, there could be like, you know, uh, all sorts of different things happening. And one of the things that they were gonna do is use drones to be able to look at, like go to all of these different houses and see what was going on there. Mm. Like the idea of like thinking of 200,000 houses, how many human beings it would take to go to every single one of those homes, especially like government employees, right? And how much money, time, effort, energy, resources would go into that for a city that doesn't have the money. With something like drones, you can do that. Essentially, you can deploy that like overnight and start getting feedback immediately. Like that is exponential technology and it like completely changes the landscape of a city potentially and how you can recover from actual, you know, physical disasters or just economic depressions over time. I mean, it's it's remarkable stuff. Absolutely. I think that's that we're really excited about those opportunities where we see that that 10x efficiency gain. And I mean, another example of that regarding roofing is in the solar industry where you're looking to install solar panels on top of a residential roof. In order to do that, you actually need to send somebody out to the property who climbs on the roof of the yep. building and makes a bunch of manual measurements and annotates exactly where all the skylights and vents and satellite dishes are. That person needs danger pay because he's climbing on yep. top of a three-story roof. Um, you don't want him to get hurt. The building owners need to be home to let him into the property. And that's manual work. If you look at a very sophisticated roof with lots of skylights and, and, and eaves and dormers, that can take hours. Whereas you can stand on the sidewalk with a drone, you can have the drone flying for six minutes and you have all the imagery you need to do a full 3D reconstruction and drone deploy and then you can measure whatever you want. You can even use that as the basis for laying out the solar panels, which we have some of our customers doing. And I think it's those opportunities where you say, okay, we're... We're saving companies money. We're making companies operate safer. We're making things more efficient that it becomes really compelling. And we want to sort of talk louder about those use cases and show where drones are doing that kind of 10x efficiency gain. I've done jobs where I've put solar panels on roofs. We, I was part of this program that was really cool here in Oakland where we did that for, uh, for some military vets' houses because I'm a vet. And uh, I can tell you, it ain't fun being on that roof. <laughs> not fun. 100 degree heat. No, yeah. it was not great. And yeah, it's a great point. I mean, my dad was an insurance inspector for 50 years, still is technically. Like another one of those use cases. This is someone who's been to thousands and thousands of buildings over the years. And the difference between doing that stuff faster is that we live in safer buildings. Like it's a huge deal when you can inspect to see if someone has a fire extinguisher or not. Like that stuff matters, it saves lives. And you see a lot of the things that being able to activate a task force, I think is just super exciting. So what about all of the data that you're collecting? What is the future for all of this? Are you looking at machine learning? Are you looking at AI? I know you have a background in blockchain, <laughs> uh, which we can talk about that. But um, yeah, where where's the future of all this data headed? Yeah, I think what's really excited us is to actually just witness the, the growth of Drone Deploy and the usage of the software over the last six years. Right now, it's used on about 600,000 job sites around the world, about 180 different countries. So that's a huge amount of data. And I think for us building a platform, we've actually uniquely positioned to have insight into watching the drone economy grow. Um, we can see what drones are being used for, where they're being used, and it really helps inform us on what products to build. And I think what's becoming particularly exciting now as we 
sort of move further into this age of machine learning and autonomy is being able to actually use that data to help our customers even more and sift out the use cases with drone imagery, which are hard or tedious or time consuming and automate them with machine learning. So we already have a lot of machine learning in the platform, helping with object detection, counting things, detecting and measuring stockpiles and a lot of our photogrammetry. And we want to push further ahead on there. I think we're uniquely positioned as a drone company. We are the largest drone software company in the world. We've got the most data. And now we want to leverage that to build even more exciting and more compelling products for our customers. So I think that's where there's going to be a large investment from Drone Deploy's point of view mm -hmm. and be seeing some very exciting products coming into the platform. That probably means somebody Sales. sold a big deal. <laughs> Sales horn. Yeah. That's pretty great. Uh, <clears throat> we have three shofars of different sizes. We've got one at each. Um, each time the company sort of continues through another round of funding, we get a bigger horn. Oh, that's and so sometimes you use just two. Announce that lunch is here or the team meeting. Might be a team meeting. Oh, that's <laughs> hilarious. Um, so what is, uh, what is some of those use cases, those machine learning and AI use cases that are, that are coming up on the horizon? Can you, can you tease that a little bit? Oh, absolutely. I think um, our framework for doing this is, is we simply want to understand every pixel. So we're collecting all this imagery. We're doing reconstructions, 3D reconstructions, point clouds and maps. And so we've got billions and billions of pixels in the platform of different scenes, construction scenes, agriculture scenes, energy, mining, conservation, forestry, emergency services. Our machine learning vision is to understand every pixel because if we understand every pixel, we can take the things that our customers are trying to do in Drone Deploy already that are difficult, time consuming, tedious, expensive, and we can automate them. So we already have three machine learning products doing that. One of them is around generating survey grade accurate data automatically without the need to manually correct and tag ground control information images. Another one of those products is about counting and tracking objects automatically in the scene. Um, very useful in terms of forestry, counting the number of trees in a forest or an orchard automatically. And they're gonna be more like that. We're trying to understand from this imagery and from our customers what they're trying to do with drones and how we can make those problems automatic. Are you ready for some lightning round action? Yeah, so these are one word, one sentence. Fast and easy questions. Easy, oh, amazing. Just like the lightning platform from Salesforce, <laughs> you can go to salesforce.com slash build mobile apps to learn more about building apps faster and easier. Fast and easy, just like the lightning round. Are you ready? I'm ready. Number one, what app are you using on your phone that is the most fun? Blinkist. Ooh. Favorite book or podcast that you've read or listened to recently? Favorite book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Favorite podcast, probably this one. I hate it now. <laughs> we'll take it. Um, do you have a favorite vacation spot? Absolutely. It's Ubud in Indonesia. Ooh, that's a new one. What do you do for fun? I play soccer, I swim, I do some pencil drawings, and I've got an extremely nerdy blog, which is thankfully pretty hard to find. No kidding? Oh, what's, what's on there? I usually take uh, questions from programming competitions and dissect them and provide different solutions to them. That's not that nerdy. <laughs> now for our listeners, um, do you have a favorite use of AI or chatbots that you've seen commercially used? I think a lot of the, the GAN stuff with deep learning networks of generating synthetic data is both terrifying but extremely exciting. Going to be a big topic in our future. Favorite productivity tool? For me, it's just a text file. It's one text file that I keep in Dropbox, and that's got my to-do list and everything else in it. What is your best advice for a first-time CTO? Don't expect it to be easy but you do need to find a way to enjoy that journey instead of holding out for some sort of outcome. What question do you never get asked that I did not ask you today that you wish you had been asked? What's the hardest thing about being a CTO? What is the hardest thing? A lot of your time is spent on technical strategy, which is about the future. 
And it's really hard to know in the present if you're making good decisions about the future. I love it. Anything else? No, that's Anything all. To plug? That's been great, Ian. Thanks a lot. I'd, I'd encourage anyone who hasn't used drones to try Drone Deploy. We really make it easy to generate some cool data. Yeah, check out Drone Deploy. We'll link it up in the show notes. Thanks so much for coming on the show. This is awesome. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Salesforce just introduced Salesforce Blockchain, the industry's first truly declarative blockchain platform integrated into your CRM. Learn more at salesforce.com slash blockchain.